Hey, this is Dave DeCamp from Antiwar.com. This is Antiwar News for Friday, September 1st, 2023. All right, the first story at the top of Antiwar.com today, Ukraine tells counteroffensive critics to shut up. So Ukrainian Foreign Minister Dmitry Kuleba on Thursday told critics of Ukraine's slow counteroffensive to shut up amid a flood of leaks from Western officials pinning the blame for the lack of success on Ukrainian commanders. So Kuleba said, quote, criticizing the slow pace of the counteroffensive equals spitting into the face of the Ukrainian soldier who sacrifices his life every day, moving forward and liberating one kilometer of Ukrainian soil after another. I would recommend all critics to shut up, come to Ukraine, and try to liberate one square centimeter by themselves, end quote. So in recent weeks, as, as I've been covering, U.S. and other Western officials speaking to the media, you know, anonymously, have criticized Ukraine's fighting tactics in a lot of ways, saying that their forces are too far spread out and that they're not using their NATO training, they're not using their combined arms training. And also they've been complaining that Ukrainian commanders are too worried about uh, casualties, saying that they're casualty averse. And Western officials also acknowledged to the Wall Street Journal that they did not believe Ukraine had enough training or equipment to dislodge Russian forces in the first place. They just hoped that they would find a hole, essentially, uh, and break through. So Kuleba's comments uh, came as other Ukrainian officials are claiming gains in the Zaporozhye Oblast. So on Thursday, the Wall Street Journal reported that Ukraine had penetrated the main Russian defensive line for the first time in the country's southeast and said that they're fighting, fighting at the edge of a village called Verbov. However, the Ukrainian success is not confirmed. And, you know, looking at the maps, you know, I use maps from South Front, um, and they've really been targeted, um, you know, and they're accused of being, you know, too pro-Russia or whatever. But they were the first ones, you know, when uh, Ukraine regained territory in, in the Kharkiv of offensive in the Northeast. South Front was the first ones to report their... Uh, that they made gains that I saw. And I wrote up a story based on their, you know, what they were saying. And, you know, that was before it was in the New York Times or anything like that. Um, so, you know, they're saying that there's fighting going on in this area um, near this village that they're talking about, but it says that the Russian army is repelling the attacks near that village. And then uh, Russian officials are saying that they're, you know, destroying Ukrainian forces in that area. Um, there's a story in TASS uh, quoting the Russian-installed governor of Zaporozhye saying that Russian forces eliminated two Ukrainian assault groups attempting to break through Russian defenses around Verbov. He claimed Ukrainian forces were scaling back their activity in Zaporozhye due to heavy casualties. So you have the Ukrainians and the Russians saying very different things. And again, I'm not seeing really the gains on the map you know ukraine has been making some incremental gains they've captured some small villages but you know even the u.s officials and everybody are saying it's not you know really any kind of pivotal gains that they've been making uh, but we'll see you know i'm sure it'll become clear in the next few days if ukraine did gain anything significant or if this is just them trying to put a positive spin on it to the media because um, as we know, the Washington Post recently reported that the U.S. intelligence has determined the counteroffensive will fail to meet its core objective of severing Russia's land bridge to Crimea. And uh, there was other reports of saying the U.S. and Ukrainian officials were arguing about, you know, the way to move forward. And in some of these reports, uh, you know, you have U.S. officials saying we still think, you know, Ukraine could make some progress, but they're not going to achieve, you know, any big victories. They and essentially, you know, that thing I went over yesterday, Senator Blumenthal, Senator Mitt Romney saying, you know, you know, saying that they're getting their money's worth in this war because the Russians are taking losses and no Americans are dying. You know, I think that makes it clear that obviously, you know, if you listen to this show, you know, this is a proxy war. But I think it's clear in the fact that the Biden administration wants to keep this thing going, 
even though this counteroffensive hasn't succeeded at all, it just goes to show that that's what they want. They just want the war to continue um, so they could keep Russia bogged down. And, you know, lots of money is to be made for sending all these weapons over there. So this kind of stalemate, I think, I don't think they have a problem with it. I think they just want to keep fueling this war for as long as they can. Um, all right, so the next one here, the EU aims to transfer $5 billion in weapons to Ukraine annually. So this is from Kyle Anzalone at the Libertarian Institute. And this is, again, another example of this long-term planning. So the European Union's foreign policy chief, Joseph or Josep Borrell, said that the bloc targets $5 billion in weapons transfers to Ukraine annually for the next four years. So this is part of the thing, again, I, I covered recently with you have the U.S., the G7 countries, the EU is technically part of the G7, are signing these, they're looking to sign these deals with Ukraine for long-term military assistance, and they're looking to give them $5 billion each year in military aid. So that's significant uh, just from the EU, you know, and then you put who knows how much the U.S. is going to try to give them. Um, and Burrell also said that the, U the EU wants to increase the amount of Ukrainian soldiers that it trains each year, up from 15,000 to 40,000. And at a press conference, uh, Burrell said the defense ministers responded favorably to his proposals, although no formal pact was made. And this is still in the very early stages. I don't think we're going to see any deal signed, you know, this year. Um, I, maybe I could be wrong about that. But again, uh, it, this is uh, just an example of the, the their thinking that they're going to keep this thing going. You know, it looks like Europe has, you know, their economy has certainly taken a hit, but they survived the winter. And I guess, you know, they think they can keep going here. All right. The next one here, China outlines obstacles to high level talks with the United States. So a spokesman for the Chinese Defense Ministry on Thursday outlined obstacles that are preventing the resumption of high-level military talks between the U.S. and China. So Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin and Chinese Defense Minister Li Shang Fu, they both attended the Shangri-La Security Dialogue in Singapore, which was back in June. And the U.S. requested a meeting between Austin and Li, but Beijing declined. And they declined for, uh, I think, a reasonable reason because there's U.S. The U.S. has sanctions. The Chinese defense minister is under U.S. sanctions. Li was sanctioned in 2018 when he was in a lower level position, and he was sanctioned for for uh, overseeing a the purchase of Russian military equipment. I don't know what how the U.S. thinks it has the right to punish China for buying Russian military equipment. Very, very strange. Um, but anyway, so. That was when he was lower level, and then he became the defense minister earlier this year, and the U.S. refused to lift the sanctions on him. And, you know, I think that goes to show you hear you see the U.S. saying, oh, we want to talk, we want talks with China, we, it's all about dialogue. But, you know, the fact that they haven't lifted those sanctions, I think, shows that they're not really that serious. And Chinese defense ministry spokesman Colonel Wu Qian, uh, he outlined other issues impeding high-level military talks besides just the sanctions including U.S. support for Taiwan and U.S. military activity in the South China Sea and Taiwan Strait. Uh, he noted that while there has, has not been talks between the U.S. and China at the defense minister level, there are other communications uh, going on between them. There was recently a conference that was hosted by the U.S. military in Fiji that Chinese officials attended and they met with their American counterparts, again, at a lower level. Uh, but Wu said that there were a series of difficulties and obstacles preventing talks between Austin and Lee, including new forms of military aid that the U.S. recently approved for Taiwan. One of those I covered yesterday, the U.S. providing Taiwan with foreign military financing for the first time, which gives them money to purchase weapons. Um, so that's, it. you know, China is opposed to all weapon sales to Taiwan. And of course, they're really opposed to this new form of military aid. Um, and he is, was also, again, saying that the U.S. is being too active in the South China Sea and the Taiwan Strait. Um, you know, mainly in the South China Sea, the U.S. and now it's bringing its other allies into the mix has really increased, you know, its military presence, sending aircraft carriers in their constant surveillance flights. 
Um, so Wu said, quote, China urges the U.S. to stop its military provocations to prevent any extreme events that the world doesn't want to see happening. We can only have communication and dialogue that is in line with our principles and does not go against our bottom lines, end quote. Um, so it's just interesting to see China spell out a few more things that they say the U.S. has to do. And I think if the U.S. did some of these things, you know, cut off this new military aid to Taiwan, scale back in the South China Sea, you know, I think that would go a long way in easing tensions with China. And, and you know, those aren't drastic moves. I mean, you know, the political climate in D.C. is so hysterical when it comes to China now that, you know, Biden's not going to do it. But, you know, it wouldn't cost the U.S. much to really significantly ease tensions with China. Um, the next one here, speaking of these tensions, the U.S. military is in talks to build a port in the northern Philippines facing Taiwan. So Reuters reported this on Thursday that the U.S. military is in talks to build a Taiwan facing port in the northernmost Philippine islands. The proposed project would be in the Batanes Islands, which are less than 125 miles from Taiwan. U.S. involvement in the project, of course, would raise tensions with Beijing as Washington is openly preparing for a future fight over Taiwan. So that's what China would think that they're doing with this port. And I think that's it's clear that is what they would be doing. Um, so earlier this year, Washington and Manila inked a deal that gives the U.S. access to four more military bases in the Philippines. That brings the total number of U.S. military facilities in the country to nine. So the U.S. has a pretty significant military presence there. And three of these new bases are in the northern Philippines, so they could be used as staging grounds for war with Taiwan, war over Taiwan. Uh, but they're not as far north as where this proposed port might be. So the governor of this Philippine province, Batanes, uh, told Reuters that the purpose of the new project would, would be to build an alternative port for shipments from Manila during rough seas in the monsoon season. Apparently there are other ports when there's you know very high water level, they have difficulty um, so, you know, it sounds like a civilian port, but, you know, if you have the U.S. military building it, that means the U.S. military is going to have access to it. And it could be another potential launching point for, you know, U.S. Uh, if they're fighting over Taiwan. And that's a pretty strategic channel between these islands and Taiwan, the Bashi Channel. Um, so uh, and Philippine officials are saying that U.S. military officials recently visited the area to discuss the potential port. And a decision is expected in October. Um, so I would guess that the, you know, the, so the Philippines are looking basically for U.S. funding for this. And I'm going to guess that the U.S. is going to take them up on this offer to give them pretty much what would probably be like another military base in the Philippines. All right. So the next one here, the U.S. and Israel to simulate attacks on Iran. So the U.S. and Israel will simulate striking Iranian nuclear facilities as part of a series of joint military exercises that will be held in the coming months. And this was reported by Israeli TV. So back in January, the U.S. and Israel conducted the Juniper Oak exercises, which were the largest ever joint drills between the two nations. The Israeli military said Juniper Oak was just the first of a series of drills that the U.S. and Israel will hold this year. Israel's Channel 12 reported one of the upcoming drills would simulate Israel facing a multi-front missile attack that will involve the deployment of U.S. Patriot missile systems, and another drill will rehearse a joint U.S.-Israeli attack on Iranian nuclear facilities. So this plan, it hasn't yet been publicly confirmed by the U.S. or Israel, but they have held drills like this before. Uh, back in November 2022, the U.S. and Israel simulated bombing Iran over the Mediterranean Sea. And, you know, they say nuclear facilities would be the target. Of course, they're always hyping up the threat of Iran's nuclear program, even though they're not building a bomb. There's no sign that they are or that they're, they're planning to. And that was recently affirmed by a U.S. intelligence report. But it doesn't matter. They're always going to be the boogeyman in the Middle East. Um, and I mentioned in the article that often missing from the conversation about Iran's civilian nuclear program is the fact that Israel has a secret nuclear weapons program and an arsenal of nukes that the U.S. does not acknowledge exists. So you always have to keep that in mind, because they say if Iran gets a nuclear weapon, it's going to start a regional arms race, but Israel already has them. 
Uh, so the report comes amid heightened tensions between the U.S. and Iran in that situation in the Persian Gulf. Since the U.S. seized an oil tanker and forced it to sail to the U.S., you know, under the guise of sanctions enforcement, and it was carrying Iranian oil. After that, Iran seized two tankers in the Persian Gulf, and the U.S. has been increasing its military presence in the region. Um, so I just want to mention again that it is our fundraiser still at antiwar.com today. As you can see from our ticker, we're, we're doing good. You know, we're definitely on track here. We're approaching uh, $50,000. We need to get our goal of 80000 And right now we have matching funds. So every dollar that you donate will be doubled. And you can go to antiwar.com slash donate to see the different ways you can help us with a credit card, PayPal, crypto, um, this is how we get by. We are entirely funded by our readers. It's the only way we can do what we do, um, you know, because of the kind of independent line that we have, our non-interventionist anti-war point of view. Um, you know, this is how we have to do it. And that means every, you know, few times a year, we have to ask our readers for money to help us keep going. And your, your donations go directly to running the site. Very, you know, uh, efficient operation. So again, antiwar.com slash donate. All right, where was I here? So the Palestinian Authority has a list of wants in exchange for Saudi-Israel normalization. So Palestinian Authority President Mahmoud Abbas has delivered a set of demands to Saudi Arabia in exchange for his support for the normalization of relations between Israel and Riyadh. According to a U.S. news outlet, this was reported by Axios. And they have a pretty good Israeli reporter over there that, uh, you know, seems to have really good sources. So I usually trust their reports. And this report said that Palestinians want status changes to areas of the occupied West Bank at present considered Area C. These are currently off limits to the vast majority of Palestinian residents of the territory and are fully under control of the Israeli military. Uh, Palestinian officials want the area to be designated Area B, which are areas under Israeli security control, but where the civilian administration is handled by the PA. And I know the PA, you know, Palestinians are not very happy with them right now. You know, they look at them as a puppet of Israel and a puppet of the U.S. Um, so it's interesting to see. I mean, it's not really surprising to see, I should say, that they're kind of open to the idea that Israel-Saudi normalization, if they can get something out of it as well, um, and it's not anything like statehood that he's asking for. Um, so I believe there was a few other things that they were looking for, but this is an article from uh, Middle East Eye. And I know the Saudis are saying they're offering, they cut off aid to the Palestinian Authority and, and they're offering to resume that. So it does seem like, you know, I've been pretty skeptical of this Saudi-Israeli deal happening but you know there's been a lot of reports and um it seems like you know the biden administration really wants to get this done before the election so you know they might want to give the saudis everything they want even though you know they're killing all those migrants and stuff at the border it doesn't seem to matter too much to the u.s all right so the next one here niger orders police to expel french ambassador so Niger's military junta ordered police to expel the French ambassador from the country and revoked his diplomatic immunity. So this, so France's ambassador was ordered to leave the country within 48 hours last Friday, but Paris ignored the deadline, and the order for him to leave was made in response for the envoy's refusal to meet with the post-coup government that ousted President Mohamed Bazoum on July 26th. So they ordered him to go last Friday. France ignored it. And now they're, they ordered the police to expel him, took away his diplomatic immunity. France is still saying he's not going anywhere. And despite this order, the French foreign ministry said that the ambassador will stay put and that the junta, which is led by General Abdelrahman Chiani, has no authority to make such an order. So according to Al Jazeera, a French military spokesman threatened military action if the situation became too tense. He said, quote, the French military forces are ready to respond to any upturn in tension that could harm French diplomatic and military premises in Niger. Measures have been taken to protect these premises, end quote. So France has about 1,500 troops in the former French colony of Niger, 
and has strongly backed threats from the from ECOWAS to intervene if Bazoom is not reinstated. Macron explicitly said this week that he would support military action against the junta. So it looks like, I mean, this is just still slowly building up, but I mean, it doesn't seem like this is going to have a good end result, um, this whole situation in Niger. And I think, you know, the U.S. hasn't been as hawkish as France has on this. You know, they met with the junta. They sent Victoria Newland over there. And apparently France was really upset about that. But I still, you know, the U.S. doesn't want to give up its drone base. And and that's part of the reason why they they seem like they might be open to working with the junta. But if France does, if there is a war, you know, and the U.S. is there, they're going to back the French and ECOWAS, of course. Um... All right, so the next one here, clashes continue between U.S.-backed militias in Syria. So this article is from Connor Freeman over at the Libertarian Institute. Fighting continued between the Kurdish-led Syrian Democratic Forces, the SDF, and the Deir Azor Military Council, the DEMC, two U.S.-backed militias in East Syria. So this was... um, The fighting continues. The U.S. military has urged an end to the tensions, which have been ongoing for four days and have left at least 40 people dead. The clashes began on Monday. They've pitted the SDF against the Arab-led DEMC, its former ally. They were kind of part of the SDF at one point. And hostility sparked when they arrested the DMC's leader, Abu Kalwa, and a senior SDF commander. Um, they're accused of crimes. Uh, that's what the SDF was accusing them of. But anyway, the, the fighting continued. Uh, it's still going on, and the U.S. is telling them to stop. And, you know, this is kind of a microcosm of what U.S. policy in Syria has been. This is something that happened on a much bigger scale, you know, when the war was, uh, you know, a few years ago when the war was much bigger. Um, you know, U.S.-backed fighters fighting each other. It was just a mess. Um All right, but the last one here, the U.S. and Germany trained the Saudis accused of killing migrants at the border. So this article is from The Guardian, and it says that Saudi border forces accused of killing hundreds of people trying to cross the border from neighboring Yemen received training from Germany and the United States. Despite growing concern over the scale of human rights abuses in Saudi Arabia under the country's crown prince and prime minister, Mohammed bin Salman, both the German Federal Police Service and the U.S. military have been involved in training Saudi border fo- forces implicated by the U.N. and human rights NGOs in mass killings. Significantly, the U.S. training agreement, the funding for which ended last month, stipulated that the U.S. was required to monitor how its training was being used with those receiving training only allowed to operate defensively to protect themselves and their sites from attack. And that's something, you know, when Biden first came in, he said he would cut off all offensive support for the Saudi war in Yemen. But that turned out not to be the case because they were still maintaining their air force. But that's how they frame the U.S. support for Saudi Arabia is as defensive. And in this case, uh, you know, there's, you know, slaughtering migrants at the border. Um, How is that defensive? Um, And but it's interesting that Germany, Germany's police were training them as well. um, kind of strange and, and just all the rhetoric you know this is why a lot of the world is not following the u.s on this policy against russia because they see the hypocrisy um, when they're supporting you know such brutality in other places and criticizing russia <clears throat> um but that's it for the news for today that's everything for the week go check out our viewpoints we have one from joe loria at consortium news u.s the victim of of own propaganda in Ukraine war. One from Ted Snyder, following the BRICS road to multipolarity. One from Ramsey Baroud, a terrorist onslaught. Why Netanyahu, Gallant, blame Iran for West Bank violence. One from Stephen Bryan, will the U.S. support intervention in Niger? And then one from Daniel Larison, don't let Saudis off the hook for migrant massacres. Um, But that is everything. I hope everyone has a good weekend. Again, please help the fundraiser, antiwar.com slash donate. I'll be back on Monday. Just another heads up. Next week, I'm taking two days off. So there'll be a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday show, and then I'm off to go, uh, you know, get a new baby boy. And uh, I'll probably be back Sunday at least to record the show for Monday. 
Um, but we'll see, you know, there's always a chance that I might have to take that first day off, but I'll keep you posted. Um, but anyway, I'll be back after the weekend. Hope everyone has a good one. Thanks for listening. <laughs>